Chapter 26 The Director's Headaches Riley rejoined Tasha and Brandon for the minimum vehicle compliment. Newly trained drivers were dispersed to other vehicles, Susan said. Is there a reason why Dr. Suzuki assigned me to drive us back rather than Brandon? Tasha replied, it's part of his strategy for saving face. He's not enthusiastic about either Brandon or me exuding authority where he can avoid it. Susan answered, you're right, given his reputation. I don't know what she said to him, but this is a total 180. Even after we got this rig out of the hole, he was on about new approaches to studying those critters. Brandon half listened to their conversation with his viewer plugged into the network. He was on a VPN to keep his electronics isolated from Dr. Suzuki. He said, Hey ladies, Kalu and Skarsgård did a passenger test flight and no glitches whatsoever. At a half dozen, Millican Station rates them for passenger travel. We're on our way. With the last of the crawlers recharged, the returning expedition set off toward the end of the glacier. Tasha plugged her viewer into the network, looking for new messages. She said, here's a note from Inofe with video saying Durga found anomalous behavior in one of our employees as yet unidentified. This is two nights before the bombing. You see this person being let in into a side gate? That's not a Star Olympus pressure suit he's wearing, but a close approximation. Brandon said, I see what you mean. See the glare whenever he is in view? He must have infrared LEDs on his suit to mess up the cameras. That right there should have alerted security. Okay. He's gone out of sight between two trains carrying construction equipment and materials. Tasha said, at least we have some solid clues. Durga has a good reputation, and I'm sure they'll narrow it down. They're making up for that bit of circuit board they missed. The caravan made better time since they were retracing the original route. Compared to LiDAR maps made by the Sojourner 2's drones, Tasha could see the path was overly cautious. She said, Dr. Suzuki was in such a hurry to get out here. It must have driven him crazy coming this way. I guess there's only so many he could bully at the same time. Brandon said, Once he gets rid of us, he'll figure out a way to come right back. He can smell that Nobel Prize. Olsen knew his friend had been thinking the same thing since they'd given the biologists their ultimatum. Tasha said, Yes, he will or he'll try. He's wormed his way through the Matrix the same way as Dr. Safford. It's a combination of brains, bluff, and not giving a damn who you step on. They've cultivated the same people on Earth to get where they are. Riley came back to the galley and said, the sojourner can drive herself for a while. Nothing but flat the rest of the way. As she assembled a couple of peanut butter and cheese sandwiches, she added, smiling, thank you guys for stocking some decent food. Now that I'm spoiled, I'll be going back on munis rations. So do you think you'll track down your wayward employee? Damn shame someone could sell you out like that. Pouring herself another coffee, Tasha said, I have no doubt we'll determine who it is and maybe even why. Until then, we don't know all the circumstances. The frontier should be a place to remake ourselves, not spiral down the other direction. Dr. Suzuki's train pulled into a Millican station siding where Tasha and Brandon disembarked. Riley was reassigned to Dr. Suzuki for the moment, much to Dr. Cassini's dismay. As Tasha and Brandon made their way through the station to the Star Olympus terminal, she said, You might be right about Suzuki. Why wouldn't they park in the Ares launch yards unless he didn't intend to stay long? Brandon chuckled. For some, a PhD behind your name is a license to do any damn thing you want, no matter how stupid. Dr. Safford asked to meet with Dr. Suzuki as soon as it was convenient. She also needed details. Anxious for this meeting himself, he showed up late in the afternoon and was shown in by Safford's human receptionist. 
Welcome back, Dr. Suzuki. Please join me in the sitting area. Make yourself comfortable. When both were seated, Colleen and Savard pressed a button in the tabletop. A robot appeared with a tea service quite unlike any Dr. Suzuki had ever seen. As it was placed on the table, Dr. Suzuki said, This tea service is very interesting. Where did you get it? Safford saw the envious look in Suzuki's eyes and relished it. Oh, well, my nephew Thomas has a girlfriend, Gina is her name. They've been spending a fair amount of time on the frontier, which is where she found it. The whole set is glass made from Martian sand. Can you believe it? Anyway, she convinced Thomas to get it for me. The exobiologist took the initiative, saying, Dr. Safford, Colleen, we did return early, but this is only a temporary setback. I'm sure of it. The director calmly said, perhaps, but you know the importance of such an expedition. Our collective scientific bona fides have been lacking of late. Van Leeuwen University is already publishing papers from the Olympus Mons find. Dr. Suzuki said, yes, I know, and despite whatever disparagement we rain on them, They've got academic credibility. I had to get rid of those two from Star Olympus. It's a hassle, but we can't have people like that around us in the field. Dr. Safford knew he was withholding information, but whatever it was, she could ferret it out later. She responded, Kaito, you were so close. The video sent, the video you sent from that crevasse was stunning. Who knows what discoveries we might make once we have access. Now Suzuki was not so sure of himself. What is it, Colleen? I plan on returning next week. We just need those tremors to die down. I didn't want to leave in the first place, but many on the team were afraid. If they don't want to go, we'll replace them with people who do. The director said, I'll have to push hard for a reauthorization. You're asking for a week's downtime at a minimum with little to show for it. The UN may not take chances, given the tremors. There may be a risk to Ares launch. I've asked Cassini and Ofori to look into it. As Dr. Safford took a bite of her cracker, Suzuki asked calmly, So, Colleen, you thought the crevasse was impressive? There's more video from our drones. That glow in the fissure was kilometers long. We really don't know how much there is, but it's deep. I need more people on my team. DNA sequencers, and other equipment. We can't have several different groups all going their own way. The director responded, Kilometers, you say? You didn't have time to look at the extent. Could you find better access? Dr. Suzuki said, There must be more desirable places, and people can work safely on glaciers. They've been doing it on Earth for 200 years. You and I could collaborate on this one. It's right up your alley. I'll characterize the organisms and basic chemistry that gives you all those juicy enzymes and proteins to unravel. We'll have new discoveries every year. Safford's mood began to soften. A chemistry prize would definitely round out my CV, she thought, provided it didn't take too long. She said, your expedition doesn't have a hard closing date, but we can't wait forever for results. It's promising at the moment. Let's hope this ice is done going walkabout. Take this time to reorganize both people and equipment. I'll talk to my RAs and postdocs. Dr. Suzuki saw Dr. Cassini in the outside office, chatting up the receptionist. He bowed briefly to him and left. The woman said, It looks like Dr. Safford is free. Cassini kissed her hand and entered the inner sanctum. The director said, Franco, would you like some tea? It's still hot. Or perhaps a cappuccino? The engineer said, cappuccino would be wonderful, though I'm a bit keyed up already. The robot cleared the tea service and shortly brought up a steaming cappuccino. Dr. Cassini took it and said, grazie. Dr. Safford waited until he was comfortable, then said, Franco, you asked for this time, so what's on your mind? Looking uncomfortable, he began, Colleen, you know we build on the most solid ground for the maglev. This means bedrock, or footings to remain secure. We level the road beds and remove barriers where necessary. To that end, explosives are the best method. The last thing the director wanted to hear about was explosives. 
she prompted. Yes, doctor. And what exactly is the problem? Cassini paused and said, some of our explosives are missing. I reported this to Lieutenant Taylor as soon as it was discovered. The charges were loaded into one of our maglev cars under great security, so he's begun an investigation. Just then, the receptionist buzzed, saying, Ma'am, Lieutenant Taylor is here to see you. He says it's urgent. The director sighed and said, Send him in, please. When he entered, he said, Dr. Cassini must have told you the bad news. We're doing everything we can. Safford was getting tired of hearing this and said, If you were doing everything you could, we wouldn't have explosives disappearing. Do we know what and how much is now unaccounted for? Lieutenant Taylor let the jibe go as he was used to it. Ma'am, we believe there are 16 packets of Sekhmet missing from Ares Launch construction stores. Explosives are a high security item, meaning they are inventoried every week. They are stored separately from other supplies and locked down with limited access. We're exploring all avenues. The director said, very well, have we received any bomb threats? or any other threats in that time? The cop said, no ma'am, nothing to speak of. Whoever snatched it had full access. It's that or he hacked his way in somehow. Dr. Safford said, Lieutenant Taylor, if you have nothing more, then I won't keep you. You're the professional. I want that segment found ASAP, along with the perpetrator. With that, the security chief took his leave. Dr. Safford asked, Franco, do you have the explosives and supplies you need to keep working? What of these tremors we've been feeling? Is that slowing down? Cassini said, there are enough explosives. We've since moved them to a more secure location with robot guards. We need ready access since they're vital to the project. As for the tremors, we've been sticking to bedrock or the next best thing. I've sent survey crews to find the northern extent of the ice. If necessary, we'll shift direction to steer clear of it. Rails connecting us to Millican Station are up and running to great relief. What's most concerning is we're not meeting our hiring quota. Recruits are waiting until the last minute. The director said, I appreciate your being frank. Keep me informed and I'll do what I can. I'm sure you've seen the recent success of Star Olympus in certifying passenger travel. That's going to cut profits for several of our preferred partners, but there's not much we can do about it. Where they can get around safety regulations, they'll take advantage of other carriers. What I need you and your contractors to do is educate those you're interviewing. Point out the advantages in having us provide law and order, pensions, benefits, reduced housing costs, colonists, loans and subsidies, etc. Make sure they know what a tedious and difficult life they'll have working on the frontier. Many of them are attracted by the glamour or think they'll get rich overnight. Can I get you to do that? Chapter 27. The Peasants Are Revolting Dr. Cassini passed the word along to his contractors and they to their subcontractors. Aries Launch had to come in on time. To a rail supplier, he said, This is the last bite at the apple, as the Americans say. We cannot have the program delays of the past or the grand mistakes, cost overruns, etc., it's our third time around for this project, and we are in second place. So do whatever you can to get your crews motivated. Contractors took this to heart, sort of. For our potential and new hires, they dangled numerous possibilities for advancement, bonuses, stock options, and pensions. None of these were presented in writing, and only a few savvy applicants asked for guarantees up front. Executives alluded to a relaxation investing timetables and knowledge of pending tax breaks as part of the one system policy. Aries launch met then exceeded their hiring quota for the first time since the project began. Employees were given housing stipends due to the shortages at Munis. For the first time, earth banks offered loans to those wishing to buy property on the frontier. This was risky since there were no friendly courts to ensure foreclosure. Dr. Suzuki's return to the glacier was bogged down with infighting between groups. Those on the original expedition claimed there was no right to exclude them. Others wanted in, following new evidence of life and exploitable resources. Tasha had hoped the ice would settle down over time, but by their third week back, she said, Brandon, 
Have you kept an eye on the seismic activity lately? Olson replied, off and on, yes, the intensity is down, but the tremors are almost routine. Tasha said, from the news reports, if we're to believe them, Cassini's survey parties are nearly at the end of the valley. He's increased hiring, so they might actually pull this off. Brandon said, the broken tracks are repaired, so we'll resume closing the gap between Olympus Mons and the North Rim. Commercial shipping and new settlers give us as much business as we can handle. Enofe, Tasha, and Brandon were having drinks at the Harsh Mistress before returning to the field. Enofe remarked, Have the newcomers taken over the Mistress? I hardly recognize anyone. Tasha said, Birds of a feather, maybe. They do rather stick to their own, if you've noticed. Brandon said, That's what bothers me. They need to get over the insular Earth mindset. Voices were raised between new two nearby tables. A woman stood up and said, Why shouldn't Mars be part of the UN? Aren't people tired of all the back and forth confusion? There's so much more we could do if we stuck together. A man at the next table rose. Ma'am, are you out of your cotton-picking mind? Why do you think most of us came here? Was it to be a faraway cog in a stale machine? Who do you think made Mars what it is today? Certainly not government. The woman answered, Mars is bigger than you or me. You colonists are always thinking of yourselves first, and the rest of humanity last. I say we should have a vote on whether the frontier stays independent or not. Let the people decide. A man in the corner booth climbed up on the table. Sure, sure, why not have a vote? Those are always fair and above board, aren't they? You can't take away my rights and my way of living by the arbitrary whim of a mob. What gives you the power to do so in the first place? You're assuming that elections have some inherent wisdom. The absurdity of it is, an election presumes de facto authority before it is established by vote. The logic is circular. I say no. So you have an election. Are you going to send goon squads after everyone who never recognized some a priori power? You're no different than any conqueror who ever lived. Tasha took in the arguments, thinking of the last time this happened on Earth. It resurfaced when the autonomous free cities were established in the Pacific, far from overt interference. They had been underestimated, and so had a handful of free settlements on Luna. The Mars frontier had friends, but did she have enough? At least two-thirds of the patrons present were new Earthers. For now, it was enough for a heckler's veto. The first woman yelled, Votes for Mars! Votes for Mars! Others at her table followed. Soon the chanting reached a crescendo. Security was on the scene in no time. The proprietors had never seen more than a minor bar fight and weren't about to have their establishment destroyed by a mob. Those shouting were asked to sit down and shut up. If they refused, they were removed. After 15 people were taken out, the heckling was still there, but softer. The woman leading the chant said, you people say you're all about freedom, but where's my freedom to speak? Tasha yelled. You're only chanting. That's not speaking. That's not reasoning. You don't know what freedom of speech means. Enofe said. Well stated, Tasha, but I fear such people may never understand. That's not to say we stop educating them. I've been hearing such rumblings about a vote and independence for Mars, as some are framing it. We are already independent, and that's what really bothers them, Tasha asked. Are there enough of them now to push matters to the brink? Like you said, it's a tactic repeated throughout history, and I'll be damned if it's going to happen here, Brandon pointed out. There's Thomas. You see those brutes standing near the wall behind his table? I noticed he sat there the whole time like he doesn't care which way Mars goes. Tasha surreptitiously grabbed several stills by aiming her viewer at the two no-necks. A couple of times their heads turned back and forth, but it was dark. Brandon and Enofe continued their discussion on tracks, power plants, and schedules while Tasha scrolled her viewer. She found the security video from the Star Olympus yards and isolated all sections, including the intruder. She added the fresh shots to the database and said, Recognize new images. Look for matching. Indirectly, she was watching Thomas. 
he pretended not to notice her. A man in Star Olympus coveralls sat down at his booth, and she grabbed several images. Not needing the computer, she recognized him as one of the newer new guys. Heinrich was his name. The viewer buzzed in her hand with a message. Recognition, 68%. Probability, Afu Tuala, Resonance, 213 Prospector Court, Bradbury Tunnel. Not wanting to draw attention, Tasha typed, Criminal record for Afu Tuala. Immediately, the viewer buzzed. Afu Tuala, two arrests, three counts assault, one count battery, one count brandishing weapon. Penalties, none. Tasha slid the viewer to Anofe and Brandon, who just shook their heads. Brandon whistled. That could be our intruder. He's the right size, though with the helmet visor and IR blockers, it's difficult to get a match. 68% is about the best you're going to do. And Ofe said, let's pass this on to Durga. Maybe they'll put a tail on him. You're already looking into our employee. The log shows Mr. The log shows that Mr. Heinrich Schweitzer keyed open that gate at the same time our mystery man entered the yard. Do either of you know him? Tasha said, I've met him a few times. He seemed all right. Very competent, but a little lost. Don't look around, guys, but he's sitting with Thomas and his goons. She reached over and scrolled to an image of Schweitzer. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see the conversation with Thomas getting animated. Setting the viewer vertically on the table, she used the side-facing camera to record what she could. Watching through the viewer, Tasha saw Heinrich gesticulating as Tuala moved closer. Brandon said, what do you suppose they're talking about? Tasha said, I'd love to know the answer to that. Maybe he didn't know what Tuala was up to. The guy works for us. Why would he want to see us bombed? Soon Heinrich left, stomping past Tuala and the remainder of the security teams. The harsh mistress settled down to a dull roar. The group finished their last picture since they had an early start the next day. Upon leaving, two people walked up to Brandon and Anofe with flyers, actually e-ink on plastic. These were as ubiquitous as junk mail in the 20th century and fully reprogrammable after a week. The original e-ink message could be erased and new content printed any number of times. Tasha said, I see the citizens have taken a new tack, as she read. Mars Frontier Council meeting proposed elections to be held in the new settlements. And Ofe said, you can bet the UN will play this to the hilt since they probably planned it. There were scores of people now wearing buttons which said, votes for Mars. The next day, two Durga agents found Heinrich Schweitzer in the locker room, pulling on his pressure suit. A tall, attractive Indian woman said, Heinrich Schweitzer, I'm Agent Chandakunda. This is Agent Conlon McAllister. You're under arrest in the matter of extensive property damage incurred by Star Olympus. If you read your employment contract and personal charter, you'll find we have jurisdiction. Please come with us. A red-headed man with a short beard waved an RFID wand over Heinrich's pressure suit nodded to his partner, then placed it in a carrier, attaching the helmet to a clamp on the outside. Heinrich's locker was emptied. Several items were bagged, including weapons, all stored in a folding carton with his name stenciled on the side. Heinrich was in shock as he left the locker room between the Durga agents. He'd finally gotten in way over his head. He was left to cool in a cell, which is more like a Japanese hotel room than any lockup on Earth. Cameras were on him full time, in case he began acting erratically. Determined either by Durga's AI or human attendance, he could be immobilized by gas or taser instantaneously to prevent damage or injury. Two and a half hours later, he was brought to an interrogation room. There, he saw a blonde woman in a dark blue Star Olympus jumpsuit, just like his. He read the name Nagorski on the upper arm. Also, Agent Kunda and his advocate, Eldritch Fielding. Agent Kunda began 
Mr. Schweitzer, we have arrested you on suspicion of involvement in the recent bombing of the Star Olympus rail lines. Maglev rails and cars were both destroyed with our forensics showing traces of the explosive segment. We have a record of you opening a gate for a person unauthorized to be in the Star Olympus yards. Your key card was logged opening the gate and your pressure suit ID was recorded at or near the vicinity of said gate. At this Kunda cue the video, which displayed in the center table of the interrogation room, Heinrich whispered to his advocate, who whispered back. He then said, I will admit that I let this person in, but you've got to believe me. I know nothing about the bombing. I was as surprised as anyone when it happened. Agent Kunda continued, Why did you let this person in when you knew you were violating security procedures? Heinrich was apprehensive. I don't know. I wasn't thinking. Well, maybe I was. I was in financial difficulty, and it was part of a deal I made to get out of it. I didn't think anything like this would happen. Kunda sat back and said, Mr. Schweitzer, those security precautions are in place, precisely to prevent damage or injury. You could be charged with attempted murder. Tasha knew that probably wouldn't happen, but kept silent. Heinrich and Fielding huddled in the corner of the room while they waited. Fielding then said, Let's cut to the chase. What exactly are you looking for? Kunda smiled and said, What we're looking for, ultimately, is the person behind the bombing. We feel your client has important information in this regard. Did he know who he was to let in? Who put him up to the op who put him up to opening the gate? Fielding said, You wouldn't ask those questions unless you already had a pretty good idea. What else have you got? Kunda knew Heinrich was a little fish. She cued Tasha's video of Heinrich letting in of Heinrich sitting in a booth with Thomas Safford, with his goons standing by, she asked, This man here, was he the one you let in to the gate? Schweitzer replied, Yes, though I didn't know it would be him until he showed up. Agent Kunda then asked, This man here, is he the one who asked you to do it? And why would he ask you? He replied, Yes, ma'am, he's the one. His name is Thomas Safford. He's some kind of big deal over at Muniz. I badly needed a loan, and this was a way of paying it off. Tasha asked, Are you a gambler, Mr. Schweitzer? Heinrich wondered how she knew. You could say that, ma'am, but I'm rapidly being cured. I felt I had to do it because the guys he is working for him, especially Tuala, don't play nice. Agent Kunda said, How you got there, Mr. Schweitzer, really isn't relevant to your violation of security. The question is, what can you do to rectify the situation? Heinrich looked at Fielding, who shrugged and said, You want to make some kind of deal, is it? Kunda asked. Is there any way your client could get us direct evidence of Messrs. Tuala and Safford's involvement in this bombing? Tasha said, Heinrich, may I call you that? He nodded yes, and she continued, Heinrich, you are very new to the frontier as am I. You're a welder. I've seen your work, and it is exemplary. That's a talent greatly needed here. Do you want to stay on Mars? Heinrich said. I love it here, Tasha continued. If this security breach becomes part of your record, you'll have a miserable time. You'd be better off returning to Earth. Heinrich looked down at his feet and said, Yes, I know that too. Kuda continued. Heinrich, we believe Thomas and Tuala were behind this, but we need evidence. We need to know where the explosives came from and how they planted the bombs. You can help yourself by getting some of those answers. Chapter 28, Tit for Tat. Tasha and Brandon were on the next train headed for Sutter's Mill. She said, It will be quite a thing having more than one city, don't you think? Brandon said, I've never really thought of it that way. I've become accustomed to living in one small place that contains everything. Maybe that's what it was like for people in Jamestown or Plymouth Colony. There is a whole world out here. Tasha pointed her finger, saying, And up there, with starflights increasing, it's easier and cheaper getting into space. Brandon said, 
you know, Dr. Suzuki is taking a whole slew of scientists and techs back to the glacier, right? There was an announcement this morning. All he's going to do is get a lot of people killed. We were way too easy on him. We should have just exposed him. Tasha answered. No, that was the right thing to do. We had to get everyone out of there and we have to keep our word. The media would spin it to make us out as villains. The UN is stirring up the newcomers, so we need a different tack. From the observation deck, Tasha had a drone's eye view of the tracks ahead and behind. They stretched to the platform's limited horizon of less than six kilometers, Tasha asked. Brandon, how do you suppose they blew up our tracks? A timer? A satellite signal? Olson said, I've thought about it. My guess is that the charges were placed on track sections, as you pointed out, near the endpoints. Other charges were attached to cars. In the middle of nowhere, the cars passed near sensors on the tracks, and they set each other off. With no long-range signal, it could be done with RFID chips. Lowering her voice, Tasha said, I believe there's a way we could solve a few problems. The crawler and drone logs include navigation data, correct? Brandon nodded while she continued, Send me the Sojourner 2 data from those logs, enough to get from the Ares launch railhead to the glacier, including the rescue and back. And I'll need one of those segment packets. Brandon said, Sure, Tash, should I ask what for? Like most of your schemes, I'll probably hate it until I love it. Tasha said, I haven't worked out all the details. Just remember, you're going to love it in the end. Dr. Franco Cassini was glad to be back in the field, away from the likes of doctors Colleen Safford and Kaito Suzuki. Arius launch had gained momentum, but he insisted that surveys be done to gauge the extent of the glacier and moraine deposits. Like his Roman ancestors, Cassini wanted this road to last. One of his engineers asked, Don't we have enough satellite data to finish mapping? Dr. Cassini said, It is enough for a theorist who understands neither how the radar works, nor getting his pressure suit filthy with regolith. It is enough for him and his computer models, but it is not enough for me. Trust, but verify, capiche? The engineers no longer questioned him, but worked with and around the seismograph crews. It's easier to beg forgiveness than to get permission, Tasha said to herself. In her mind, there was no time to waste. She checked out one of the sturdier drones with a supercapacitor battery, plus a reserve. The drones were modular, so she pondered what she needed for this mission, including a mini winch, and a good length of the finest twisted pair lead wire she could find. Calculating the distance from Sutter's Mill to Millican Station to the end of the Aries launch line and the site of the Bill Gates rescue, she figured there was just enough time. Crawlers were much slower than drones. They stopped in fewer places but stayed longer. Brandon stopped by to deliver the segment. Taking in her workbench, he said, so this is your project? I must say it's beginning to grow on me. She smiled and asked, Say, do you have an idea what track use is like for Ares launch? I mean, is there real traffic most of the time? Brandon said, nearly constant. They're working two shifts, six days a week, sometimes three. Tasha reflected. Riley tells me Cassini shifted north to stay clear of the Moraines, so we're safe there. Brandon looked over the work so far. Your problem is you have a lot of ground to cover and no ability to recharge. The photocells might put you over, but it will be close. Tasha took a break, then after lunch, resumed her work, checking over all connections and circuits. It was going to be a long trip. Once satisfied, she removed the Star Olympus decal and replaced it with Marvin the Martian and his alludium. PU-36 Explosive Space Modulator. Brandon joined her for dinner and she briefed him 
on her plan. I'm going to fly down our tracks and inductively recharge. I've worked the stops into our schedule. The tricky part will be recharging on the Aries launch rails without getting run over, Brandon said. Avoidance reaction time should be swift enough, but you should program escape modes just to be sure. After dinner, the drone was placed in an outside pass-through and sent south along the Olympus right-of-way. Once it reached Millican Station, it rose and flew into the dark sky, using only sonar to avoid other drones and obstacles. Reaching the area's launch tracks, the drone flew along at maximum velocity until it was time to inductively recharge. Tasha and Brandon watched on the simulator to estimate its actual position since it was in communications blackout. Satisfied with a full charge, the AI lifted the drone to move westward again at top speed. When the drone reached the end of the line, Brandon said, this is where it gets interesting, Tasha answered. If both batteries are fully charged, the AI will go ahead, but not flat out. Power versus distance will be optimized. The drone's route was based on the paths of Sojourner 2 and Dr. Suzuki's party. Corners were cut while moving as the crow flies. Tasha said, The simulator shows a good power margin, and I tried to be conservative. Now we'll find out. After three more hours, nothing had happened, Tasha said. Well, Olsen, I'm screwed, aren't I? It's really going to hit the fan this time. Brandon didn't know what to say, but tried to be reassuring. You knew it was a close thing, but another battery pack would have been too much weight. Remember what they say, it ain't over till it's over. Tasha grabbed his arm and said, you're right, it's not over. That drone could be anywhere on that ice and transponders are off. It might never be found. Brandon left and Tasha tried to sleep. After an hour or more of tossing and turning, she drifted off. Dawn came slowly to the Noctis Labyrinthus. The drone sat on ice more than 100 degrees C below zero and two billion years old. Rays of sunlight were struck the photocells obliquely with only a trickle of electrons moving toward the batteries. In another hour, the sun was higher. The flow of energy carrying particles to the charging circuit increased. Tasha awoke and checked her viewer in vain. If something had happened, she would have known by now. The drip of the coffee maker gave her some solace. By 10 a.m., Tasha was working and had all but given up on her plan. Then she remembered the photovoltaics. She'd almost removed them to save weight, but for Brandon's comment. The drone was now at a relatively balmy minus 70 degrees C, but near to a full charge. The AI calculated it was 15 meters short of the crevasse, so the blades began to turn. Shortly, the vehicle was in the air, scouting its position and moving over the fissure. Pitons left over from the cable bridge protruded from the ice, verifying the location. As Tasha poured her third cup of coffee, the drone lowered a packet of Sekhmet high explosive into the pit. The target was as deep as the micro cable and wire permitted. Once sensors determined the package could descend no further, the AI stopped the rotors. The drone fell for three full seconds before the AI sent its last instruction. Detonate. Several amperes flashed along the wires, snaking down from the drone into the attached package. Gases from the explosion impacted both walls of the crevasse and channeled deep into the fissure. Compression waves slammed into previously lost packets in rapid succession. There was no sound in the thin atmosphere, but everyone felt the initial shock, then vibration, then more shocks to rattle homes and businesses. Alarms went off in Munis and the new settlements, as they did in Tombstone, Deadwood, and Sutter's Mill, where Tasha was smiling from ear to ear. She wanted to shout and celebrate her victory. As she'd done in the Frontier Deli, she reassured everyone that by following procedures, all would be well. Within a few minutes, a single epicenter of multiple events was determined, along with approximate intensities. The coordinates were very close to those of the meteor, 
with a depth of 50 meters. Thus, most attributed the cause of this delayed effect to be the wayward space rock. Brandon sent a thumbs up emoji to Tasha. Several groups and curious individuals monitored seismic activity and knew the difference between natural quakes and explosives. Explosives produce stronger compression waves than natural quakes. The relative amplitudes of S or transverse waves and P or compression waves are revealing. From direction and timing, geographical location, depth, and source are calculated. The meteor strike and uptick in glacial tremors plus the Aries launch survey spawn new interest. Dr. Cassini's survey teams determined almost immediately that these shocks were man-made or had human assistance. The ground had been rumbling ever since Dr. Suzuki's group left the ice. One of his seismologists thought he'd seen something like it not long ago. In the late afternoon, Raiden Egberg notified Cassini that he'd found something very curious. From his vehicle near the edge of the ice, he appeared on the engineer's viewer. Dr. Cassini, I trust you are well after a late morning event? Cassini replied, yes. We're fine here, and nothing is impeding the work. What do you have for me? The geologist continued. I put an AI to work, deconvoluting what were clearly signals from multiple explosions. One by one, the computer split them into five separate tracks. I'll display them for you, Dr. Cassini then asked. This is not my field. What's my looking at? Egbert went on. A cursory glance should tell you they are nearly the same, only the timeline has shifted, Cassini said. So these are multiple events in rapid sequence. Is that natural? Touching his nose, Egbert said, exactly. There's nothing natural about it. Take a look at this graph. What do you see? Cassini knew he was being educated, but it was still tedious. It looks the same as the others, so what is it? Egberg answered, that is an explosive charge. Now I'll show you some typical ice quakes from Earth and Mars, plus the meteor strike. The engineer said, those don't look like the first plots you showed me. Rainer went on, okay, last plot. Egberg saw the puzzled look on Cassini's face before being asked, all right, Rainer, what am I looking at? Egberg said, it's from the glacier, a few kilometers west of the meteor strike. It occurred while Suzuki's group was there, Cassini said. That is an explosion, most definitely. Chapter 29, The Age of Discovery Days later, Dr. Suzuki was consumed with last-minute tasks before resuming his expedition, but now had a bad feeling. Tasha pleaded that the ice fields were not safe, and he was secretly glad they had left. But he thought, how bad could it be now? Dr. Safford left a message wanting to see him before he made any more preparations. Late in the afternoon, he appeared in her office. She greeted him and said, You'll be happy to know Munis has passed all of our safety checks with very little damage. The biologist said, That is excellent news, Dr. Safford. My team is going to need a lot of support in the next few months. The director was more formal than usual, thought Suzuki, who said, I can still count on your support, Colleen. We both know how important this is. Dr. Safford said, That's why I've asked to see you. It seems you were on the verge of discovering new Martian ecosystems, and we'll get there in time. Suzuki was confused. In time? I've got the train loaded and we're doing a last-minute walkthrough. Dr. Safford waved his protest aside. Kaito, in these preparations, have you seen the latest images of Noctis Labyrinthus? The exobiologist was caught out. I've been very busy, so I can't say that I have. Dr. Safford smiled. I thought as much. Fortunately for us, I requested images for the crater in your work area. I'll display them here on the large viewer. Suzuki saw several images with date stamps, all taken at night. Dr. Safford said, The images were dark when your expedition arrived. 
After a couple of days, enhancements indicate a faint glow emanating from several figures. Between the large quake and present, all night images are black as coal. Still in denial, Dr. Suzuki asked, That's very interesting, but what does it have to do with my research? The director closed the previous image files and displayed new ones from the latest daylight sweeps. She then said, Kaito, old friend, these images are the latest and greatest. They reflect the same coordinates as your glowing fissures. As you can see, there are few crevasses and no bioluminescence indicated. Recent slides have pushed them, closed, or rearranged them. The exobiologist was crushed. We could take ice core samples, he said. The director responded. I won't talk you out of it, but it's the proverbial needle in a haystack. It may be an exaggeration, but the opportunity to study ecosystems as a whole may be lost. Where I'll put my foot down is taking a large group out there before we're satisfied it's safe. Suzuki's shoulders sagged further, as he said. Very well, Dr. Safford. I'll pare down the bulk of my researchers to concentrate on safety. We'll watch the seismic activity in the meantime. In one last shot, the Munis director said, That's wise. To help things along, I'm assigning some of Dr. Cassini's team. Dr. Cassini was not a political animal. He wanted only to contribute as an engineer and a builder. In his eye, the mindset of those choosing to destroy was an anathema. Though he was a busy man, he was still enthralled with the Star Olympus project. He knew only that they had shut down for some time before resuming operations. As director of Ares Launch, he had gained the same access to satellite data as Dr. Safford. One evening, he asked his AI, scan the Star Olympus right-of-way in the Mariner Valley. Look for breaks or interruptions in the last four months. Exclude standard end of line. In less than a minute, thousands of images were culled to a few dozen. Coordinates were indicated for each. Cassini said out loud, That's no Mars quake, nor is it high-speed mechanical failure. That's deliberate. He sat for several minutes, contemplating connections and consequences. Why hadn't Colleen ever mentioned this? She's far more concerned over Star's progress and the UN's ability to keep up. She's a social climber, but would she stoop to sabotage to make points? He wouldn't say anything to her for now. What about Star Olympus? There was no bad blood between himself and either Nagorski or Olsen. The next day, he found Riley, who had returned from Suzuki's group. Calling her out, he said, Susan, Susan, I'd like to speak with you, please. Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Curious as to what the boss wanted, she said, Certainly, I have time. This is my first day back. Once they were seated in the commissary, Riley asked, So, Dr. Cassini, what can I do for you? Cassini emptied a cappuccino packet from his personal stash into a cup and poured hot water over it. He asked, Can you tell me what happened out there with Dr. Suzuki? You were there when he made his great discovery, no? Wary of where this was going, Riley said, Yes, I suppose you could say that, Cassini said. I mean, you were there with Brandon delivering the repaired crawler, correct? Susan said, yes. We brought it out with some others whom Brandon trained. He was the closest Mars had for a certified driver, and he volunteered. Susan knew Cassini was different from the others and trusted him to a point, she asked. Is there something specific that you'd like to know, Dr. Cassini? Not knowing how to proceed, Cassini asked, other than this discovery, did anything unusual happen out there? Riley sat back and sipped her coffee. Yes, I'll tell you this since I was never actually sworn to secrecy. Dr. Suzuki's crawler disappeared the next morning. Tasha, Brandon, and I had to rescue them. They had fallen into a crevasse they were exploring. After telling Dr. Cassini the tale, leaving out the bits concerning Sekhmet, she said, there is more, but you should talk to Tasha directly. I'd feel more comfortable and you'd get more out of it. The engineer asked, do you think she would see me? There's a lot of bad blood between Munis and the Frontier these days. Riley smiled. 
Sure she would. She's always had kind things to say about you. Having obtained Tasha's contact information, Cassini said, Thank you, Susan. I'm trying to clear up a few mysteries, and Tasha may be the key. When contacted, Tasha said, Sure, Dr. Cassini, I can meet you. You can probably help me as well. How about Mark Watney's at 8? It's out of the way, meaning it's not frequented much by Munis personnel. Dr. Cassini arrived in Mufti and found a booth. Tasha entered to greet the bartender and several others before she spotted him. She held out her hand, asking, How are you doing, Dr. Cassini? I hope there are no hard feelings. The engineer smiled as he waited for her to sit. Please call me Franco, and no, there are no hard feelings other than my initial jealousy for your project. Tasha said, I ordered a pitcher of Opportunity Lager. You do drink beer, if I remember, and this is made right here, not powdered. Shortly, a robot arrived with the beer, and Tasha poured. Cassini said, This is wonderful, really, but perhaps you're curious why I contacted you? Tasha laughed. I have to admit you're one of the last I would have expected. Cassini wasted no time telling her of his findings. You see... I've seen bombings similar to what you've experienced during the anti-EU riots in Italy. I assume you're investigating? Tasha asked. Dr. Cassini, I'll tell you this. We've found bomb residues that look like Sekhmet. That's something nearly impossible for us to obtain. The explosives we use for Star Olympus are workable, but this rock hasn't moved in billions of years. Are you using it for Ares launch? The Italian looked serious. Tasha, normally we cannot import such powerful explosives to Mars, but strings were pulled. The UN and Earth contractors are desperate to remain relevant. They're cutting corners, and I keep pushing back. Recently, I discovered a quantity of segment missing. He went on to tell Tasha about the seismic data and his suspicions. Tasha fiddled with her hair calming and retying it into a ponytail. She responded, I'll tell you this, in confidence, we're on to some little fish with respect to sabotage. If you shake this tree at the top, perhaps we can meet in the middle. Tasha said good evening to her old boss with a promise to stay in touch. Tasha looked forward to sleeping in her own quarters after bouncing around all over Mariner Valley. Ten minutes into the Asimov Tunnel, she noticed Heinrich walking on the opposite side. A large Samoan man was following at about 50 feet. She said to herself, this can't be good. Waiting as he passed, she followed. Heinrich turned down a smaller tunnel toward his flat. When she caught up with them, the Samoan had Heinrich cornered between two recyclers and no way out. She placed a hand on her weapon, but waited. Tuala said, Mr. Schweitzer, you were seen entering a Durga Associates substation. Is there anything you'd like to tell me? Tuala took one large step toward Heinrich, who said, Hey man, they didn't get anything from me. You and Mr. Safford don't have to worry. Tuala was not convinced. He said, They don't drag people off the street for no reason. What did they want with you? I don't have all night to wait for answers. I can yank them out of you right here. Tuala lunged toward Heinrich who managed to dodge him. He was distracted by Tasha yelling, Stop right there! At over two meters and 130 kilograms, Tuala could only laugh. What are you going to do about it, Missy? He pulled out a club, but didn't think he needed it. He raced toward a small figure, silhouetted in the tunnel lights. Tasha waited to nearly point-blank range and fired. Two sets of taser leads shot out, catching the large man in the chest and groin. He dropped instantly, rolling and flipping around on the ground. She told Heinrich, Hurry, turn him over. I don't know how long he'll stay down. From a pocket of her coveralls, she grabbed a handful of zip ties. She handed two to Heinrich, saying, Put one around his wrist. This dude's a monster. Loop another one through that. She did the same with his right wrist. Then Daisy chained him all before tightening, she asked. Heinrich, where are your zip ties? Can't you help here? Okay, just hold his legs then. I might have enough. Tasha just finished trussing up the brute before he regained muscle control. 
Heinrich, she said, you're living on the frontier. And there's no depending on police. There are no police, only security companies. They're more reliable, but not omnipresent. It's incumbent on us to look out for ourselves. That means keep a weapon, zip ties, and a way to communicate. Above all, you need to work on situational awareness. Is this the man you let into the yard? Heinrich had the look of a man who was tired of being afraid. He said confidently, this is the one. He works for Thomas Safford. Tasha quickly contacted Durga Associates. Hello, this is Tasha Nagorski from Star Olympus. I have one for pickup at the end of Asimov Tunnel. The agent is Chanda Kunda. Suspect is Afu Tuala. Case number is 033-397-556. Within minutes, a Durga hover showed up. Chanda Kunda stepped out in plain clothes that were far from plain. Two attendants moved quickly to strap Tuala into a stretcher with even more restraints. He tried to spit on Tasha as they rolled him into the vehicle. Kunda waved the attendants on, then said, Nice company you keep there, Tasha. She laughed. Well, they can't all be Prince Charming, can they? I had to hit him twice. I hope he has a nasty headache. Realization set in for Schweitzer. I guess I'm blown now. To all his buddy has the same reputation and he's going to be pissed. Tasha said, You've been a tremendous help, but you're right. It's probably not safe to hang around. We'll reassign you to the volcano in the meantime. Kunda said, I agree, but with Heinrich and Tuala out of the picture, we still need a way to get to Safford. Tasha and Chanda escorted Heinrich to his flat where he could pack. Chanda said, Heinrich, you'll stay with Durga in protective custody until you can be transferred to Star Olympus and the volcano. No one can get at you way out there. They parted ways, and Tasha returned to her own digs. Thomas was putting in some face time back in the Canadian bio labs. Gina tried to pry him away for lunch. He said, I should go with you. Dr. Suzuki is here, and none too pleased. I didn't have to deal with his mood swings while he was away. Gina said, one way or another, you're going to have to work things out. I don't know what happened before he left, but it soured you both. Safford knew she was right. The problem was he and Suzuki thought too much alike. They were both ambitious, unscrupulous, and knew too many secrets about each other. Safford thought back to that night when he believed he was alone in the lab. he just returned from business in the new settlements. He left a large satchel outside his office while he went to the lavatory. When he came back, Suzuki was there, poking through it. Thomas was caught, and there was nothing he could do. Dr. Suzuki said, My, my, Mr. Safford, you've been a busy little bee, haven't you? This dreary government job doesn't satisfy your needs. Then he said, Authorization, Suzuki, Kaito, MD, PhD. Laboratory lockdown. Thomas tried to be cool, but his voice couldn't hide the panic. So, Dr. Suzuki, you've found some contraband. Do you think that gives you power over me? I've been in worse scrapes. Suzuki slowly pulled items from the bag. Let's see, we have precious metal ingots, some identified mood enhancers, automatic pistol and ammunition, oh, and a decent quantity of segment high explosives. Planning on throwing a party, are we? The exobiologist was smiling, which meant he wasn't going to turn Safford in. Thomas thought, I'm in a bad position, but I still have cards to play. The scientist said, Mr. Safford, I understand young fellows like you with an eye for opportunity. I admire that. However, there is always a price to pay, Thomas said. Let's cut to the chase. What do you want? Suzuki had the contents of the satchel laid out on a lab bench. To make a show of it, he put a finger to his lips as he walked back and forth. Let's see now. I believe I'll take half of the segment. Two of these are thenium ingots and one osmium. That's letting you off rather lightly. Now I want you to take what's left. Never bring it into the lab again. The Russians have been eyeing the space, and you're not getting us kicked out. 
Thomas hoped that was the end of it, but knew it never would be. He was in the game now. He'd gotten off easily, but then isn't that how he suckered all of his clients? Frogs in a pot stayed there as bit by bit the heat turned up. When they began to boil, it was too late. Chapter 30 The Will of the People Dr. Safford was pleased to hear of the democracy movement in the new settlements. This is exactly what the UN and Earth governments were looking for. This they could sell at home. Thomas brought her leaflets and copied her on trends in social media. She sent a message. To the Honorable Secretary General, Zafri Rama, it should please you that many on the frontier desire a vote on annexation. Perhaps our demographic strategy is working better than expected. Though they're not the majority, they're persistent and vocal. Sympathetic media on Earth will be key. Progress on Ares launch has had some hiccups. I believe you're up to speed on the large ice quake we experienced. The glacier appears to have stabilized, does not threaten Ares launch, which should be out of the Mariner Valley in five or six months. Brandon told Tasha, Riley texted me. It appears Dr. Suzuki has abbreviated his expedition. There are vague official explanations about delicate ecosystems, etc. She replied, It's a way to save face while casting dispersions on private research. Do you think he'll connect the dots? Olsen and Schweitzer were inspecting power conduits at a way station southeast of Olympus Mons. Brandon occasionally glanced at Tasha on his visor. She was at Sutter's Mill installing recyclers. He said, He has every reason to think you or I did it. Too bad the proof is under a hundred million tons of ice. Tasha asked, Is Heinrich with you? Can you patch him in, please? Heinrich said, This is Schweitzer. What can I do for you, Ms. Nagorski? She asked him, Maybe there is something. You said Thomas took payment from you in the form of, of a favor. Was that something he does often? The technician said, yes, ma'am. He makes oodles of money from currency trading and loan sharking, but he values his favors. Problem is, you never know if you're square with him. Tasha continued. So you open a gate. What else might he ask for? Heinrich answered. He keeps everything compartmentalized, but he'll trade for skills like hacking, fabricating machines or circuits or stealing things he doesn't have access to. Tasha said, Thank you, Heinrich. That could be very useful. After signing off with Brandon, Tasha said, Call Durka Associates, Agent Chanda Kunda, please. After a few moments, Kunda appeared on her visor. Agent Kunda here. Oh, hello, Tasha. What's up? Tasha passed on what Heinrich had just told her. Kunda said, that's interesting. It might tie some things together. We're looking into Safford's known associates. Things are getting hectic with these democracy rabble-rousers, but we'll look into it. There's one more thing. Tuala has a buddy by the name of Malosi Safotu working for Safford. They've been inseparable since they came to Mars three years ago. Keep an eye out. He's even more unstable with Tuala locked up. Later, Tasha asked, Brandon, have we spent too much time in the hinterlands? Is this democracy nonsense gaining traction? He replied, That's possible. You and I know what's what, but we were skeptical from the beginning. It's this flood of newcomers from Earth who are ignorant. Their minds are made up for them by schooling and the media. There are vote advocates within Star Olympus, but we have a good record for talking sense into them. Tasha replied, enough have stirred things up, it seems. It's on the Mars Frontier Council agenda next week. In Ofe, Brandon, Ole, and Tasha thought it best to attend the Hotel Bradbury Ballroom to hear the arguments. And Ofe said, this comes up every 20 years or so when there is an influx of Earthers. It inspired my father in moving his family to the frontier. Tasha nudged Brandon. There's Thomas at 10 o'clock. I wonder what he's doing here, Brandon remarked. I see him. He has quite an entourage these days. Ollie said, 
You can almost tell who the new earthers are. Most of them are without sidearms, but Safford's recruits get with it straight away. The chairman of the Frontier Council, Karim Terzi, brought the proceedings to order. There are many newcomers tonight. Welcome to you all. The Mars Frontier Council is a forum for discussion. It is not a governing body. Votes here are non-binding and represent an incomplete snapshot of public opinion. Be that as it may, we find the council useful as a sounding board where any and all opinions are given a hearing. Attendance in the audience could activate individual viewers onto the public address system. Once recognized, Tasha said, as many of you know, Star Olympus is the first to build a mass driver to orbit system on Mars. You may be aware that operations were interrupted for several weeks. We have conclusive proof this was sabotage. It was the result of several bombs planted on both cars and rails. We've identified the explosive as Sekhmet, to date unattainable on the frontier. Our investigation is ongoing. If anyone has relevant information, please contact Star Olympus or Durga Associates. In no favor, remarked. That struck a nerve, as it should. It's the largest crime of this type since settlement began on Mars. A man in the crowd was recognized and said, You see, that right there is the reason we need government. We need law and order, or we'll be at the mercy of anyone carrying out such violence. Brandon stood up. She just stated Sekhmet was not available on Mars based on Earth laws passed by Earth governments. They're either unable to prevent it or bypass their own rules whenever it suits them. Do we trust entities that only defend you when the mood strikes them? A woman said, It would be so much easier if the government took care of food, air, water, police, and medical care. It's too confusing dealing with all these different companies. Tasha said, Ma'am, those are all choices that affect you and your family. Are they so unimportant you leave them for faceless bureaucrats? Should others make decisions on what food your kids eat or force them to take experimental drugs? Mars is about living your life without dictating to others how to live theirs. We have competent people in investigating this bombing with a better record than the so-called authorities on Earth. Loyalties are with their clients, not politicians or cronies. An older man stood to speak. Hello, my name is Alphonse Gladstone, prospector by trade. I was born and raised on Mars, and there's no way I'll submit to the UN or any arbitrary mob. One thing I'll say is that massive icequake at Noctis Labyrinthus wasn't natural. Those shocks, all in rapid succession, were explosives based on the seismograph data. It was all part of some reckless UN operation. We weren't warned ahead of time, nor did anyone offer the truth afterward. To them, we're not human beings, only collateral damage. Murmuring in the crowd increased. A woman stood to say, I came here based on all the UN promises. I don't have the skills required for building the maglev system, but I have plenty of others. Just try to get a business going at Munis. They run you from one department to the next, getting permits or exemptions. Half the time they don't know the procedures themselves. All I want to do is open a coffee shop. Why is that so difficult? On the frontier, all I need is space for tables, a small kitchen, bathrooms, etc., and I'm done. Any other requirements are suggested by my insurance and security agents. Munis worries about all kinds of things, as if they're personally liable. I'm opening my shop next week at Sutter's Mill. Finding a place took me half a day, and the rest of my time I spent on business. Karim Terzi then spoke. The topic of annexation is on our agenda, so I will address it. As stated, the Mars Frontier Council is not a ruling body. Our contracts reject government for want of any logical basis. We do not live under rules made by dictators nor by vote. Rulers are unjust either to the majority or the minority. 
Here we literally live by our own rules, written by each of us and available to everyone. Those rules adjust to create a true social contract rather than an arbitrary one. To pledge with your own signature that you will not threaten, dominate, injure, or steal, or swindle means something. It's more powerful than arbitrary constitutions enforced by bureaucrats. That's a personal commitment you've made in a public contract enforced by agencies we select in a free market. Then the chanting began, slowly and quietly at first. We want to vote. We want to vote. We want to vote. Longtime residents in the crowd told the hecklers to shut up, but the volume only increased. Karim Terzi banged his gavel, shouting, This is what I'm saying. Your shouting means nothing. It is only disruption. Durga and other security companies began hurting the worst offenders toward the exits. Tasha saw pushback coming from Thomas Goons and questionable toughs in the audience. They surrounded and protected the hecklers as they coalesced and moved to the center of the ballroom. Brandon said, Tasha, Thomas is clearly issuing orders. See there? He's directing people to the stage. She said, Security anticipated agent provocateurs, but not this many. It's time to put our money where our mouth is. Agents began tasing unruly protesters, but there were too many. At the same time, thugs were clubbing security personnel. Seeing wobbly Democrats regain muscle control, Tasha shouted, You, and you there, when they go down, make sure they're restrained. There's too many of them, so it's time to pitch in. Gladstone, the old miner, looked her way and winked. She saw him wielding a ten-shot taser with two more on his belt. To the group Tasha addressed, he said, Follow me, I'll take him down and you gift wrap him. Tasha became separated from her party but spotted Safford. Thomas was protected by men who mercilessly beat anyone in their path. He was heading toward a side exit. She yelled, Safford, you're not getting away after stirring all this up. We're on to you. He and his entourage pretended not to notice One small blonde woman they considered only a nuisance. At the edge of the crowd, they changed tack, following the wall toward the lobby. Tasha saw she was closer and waited that direction to cut him off. Agent Kunda was ten human layers behind Tasha, following her lead. Breaking into the lobby, Tasha was glad to be out of the ballroom and able to breathe. Immediately, she scanned the exits for Safford as she checked the charge on her taser. The first two bodyguards came out slowly, and her heart sank. They were wearing a light form of body armor. It wasn't battlefield issue, but could easily stop taser projectiles. One spied her there and pointed her out to the other. Another six of Safford's no-necks emerged with him at the center. Safford stepped forward. Hey there, long time no see, Tash. You know I'm beginning to like the frontier. There's a lot of opportunity for those who are really looking. Knowing it was futile, Tasha took the safety off her multi-shot taser. Maybe she'd get lucky. Even then, his boys would just rush him out of here. Thomas said, That's a nice toy you have, but you see we all dress for this occasion. He pointed his gun at her, an antique Colt 1911. He said, I prefer this. It belonged to my many times great-great-grandfather who helped put down the Philippine Rebellion. Do you know why it was invented? Tasha said, as a matter of fact, I do. Natives of the Philippines did not always go down, using the caliber of weapons carried by the U.S. Army. They needed a forty-five caliber for the stopping power. It was for killing guys like your friend Tuala, because they weren't liberating the Philippines. They were stealing it. Tasha drew out this battle of wits, buying time as red dots danced from one flunky's chest to the next. Tasha heard three cracks in quick succession, with three of Safford's men dropping. Instinctively, she dove to the floor before another three cracks brought down the same number. The two remaining bodyguards pushed Safford to the floor to reduce their cross-section. Safford had dropped his forty-five, and, against the actions of his protectors, was crawling forward to retrieve it. 
Behind her, Tasha heard a woman's voice yell, Stay down, just stay down, Thomas. By this time, more of Safford's people had emerged from the ballroom. Turning slightly, Tasha could see Chanda taking aim with her rifle to pick off the newcomers. The boys on the ground were recovering, but if they made it to their knees, they were hit again from behind the registration desk. The man with the rifle was wearing a visor. When he looked her direction and smiled, she recognized Lieutenant Taylor. Tasha was the only one watching as Safford reached his weapon. By instinct or dumb luck, she put two taser blasts into his forehead. Seeing they were all down, onlookers rushed the entourage with zip ties to immobilize them. With the carnage apparently over, Tasha stood up to greet Agent Kunda as she shouldered a pulsed energy projectile weapon. Soon, Lieutenant Taylor emerged carrying the same model. Handing it back to Chanda, he said, This thing is pretty sweet, but I hope I won't have to use one for a while. Tasha remarked, Is a new era of detente blooming on Mars? Lieutenant Taylor answered, Don't say anything to Dr. Safford, but I like to keep my options open, including the back channels. After she contacted me, it became obvious we were on the same trail. Agent Kunda said, Tracking segment was a dead end for us, and Lieutenant Taylor needs a way to rein in an errant prince, Taylor said. And as I understand it, young Safford's side ventures, though many of them allowed, were becoming a nuisance in the new settlements. Judging by the leg breakers he employs, that's putting it lightly, Tasha said. Thomas is well protected by his aunt, isn't he? Kunda replied. He might be in Munis, but not here. His behavioral contracts are bare minimum. He's not reading the fine print. Once he's on the ropes, they'll come out of every tunnel, pressing charges. Taylor continued. He may be plumb out of favors with respect to Dr. Safford. We got a warrant and searched his quarters. I found explosives and several other interesting items. To save the family name, she'll find a quiet place to stick him. Chapter 31 Mars is not big enough. A meeting was held a week later at Durga Associates. In attendance were Tasha Nagorski and Ofi Kalu, Chan Nakunda, Lieutenant Jedediah Taylor, Thomas Safford, Dr. Colleen Safford, and her lawyer, Cyrus Brownell, second. Agent Kunda opened. Along with Thomas, frontier security firms rounded up 13 of Mr. Safford's men. He is being held on charges of assault, inciting violence, and sabotage, just to get started. Dr. Safford said, This is ridiculous. I insist that Thomas be remanded to my custody. Your laws do not apply to him. The lawyer wrote a few lines on his e-ink pad and showed it to the scientists. Munis jurisdiction ends outside Munis compound. Enofi said, if I may, Mr. Brownell, does your law apply to all contracts signed by its citizens, regardless of the second party status? The lawyer said, Ahem, well, I'm not a contract law expert, but that should be the case, yes. Anofe said, Perhaps we have a point of agreement. Here we have contracts with strong enforcement provisions, Tasha said. It's plain to see that Thomas is a bad actor. What consequences will he face if he's handed over? Scowling at Tasha, Dr. Safford said, Ridiculous. Thomas is a good kid, precocious maybe, but bright and talented. And what, pray tell, are you doing here anyway, Ms. Dagorski? With a look of impatience, Lieutenant Taylor posted images to the main viewer. Dr. Safford... Dr. Cassini made you aware of several packets of high explosive used in construction went missing. Those packets are laced with fibers, which fluoresce at frequencies we can follow. Manufacturer, explosive type, and lot number are assigned to each packet. We follow the shedding fibers to the laboratory where Mr. Safford works and to his quarters. Incidentally, Dr. Suzuki is being arrested as we speak. Dumbfounded, Dr. Safford said, Kaito? What? Why? Lieutenant Taylor continued, 
At the Canadian Biolab, the trail of fibers split. We figure a deal was made. But no matter, we have Dr. Suzuki for possession of dangerous explosives. The implication is clear. Thomas is linked to sabotage of a Star Olympus train. Now it was Taylor's turn for a dirty look by Safford. Surely you can't mean that. Even if it were true, Star Olympus has no standing, her lawyer mused. Still, an ambitious prosecutor may try to establish precedent. The scientist shot back. Cyrus, are you representing Thomas or Star Olympus? Tasha said. To answer Dr. Safford's question, I am a shareholder of Star Olympus and as such an injured party. In addition, he pointed a loaded weapon at me, which constitutes assault. Dr. Safford sighed. You know, I have very powerful friends on Earth. The frontier is not entirely self-sustaining. Enofe said, True, but you might be surprised at what we are capable of. We too have allies on Luna and Earth. We supply you with strategic materials at a good price. The UN should pay heed, but we're not here to escalate matters. Are Thomas and his bully boys worth all that? Thomas gave his aunt a pleading look. Dr. Safford said, I came here ostensibly to get my nephew out of jail. Is that what we're talking about? Or negotiating some wider interest? Tasha said, for starters, we want an end to Earth interference in frontier affairs and business. That means no more spying, intimidation tactics, or bombings. We recognize Ares launch as an asset for Mars. We're willing to compete on a level playing field. When it's finished, let it run as a business without subsidies. Next, I speak for most of the plaintiffs to say getting Thomas out of our hair is a desirable outcome. However, he has amassed quite a bit of profit off the backs of hard-working people. The frontier arbiter must award those plaintiffs from hard currency recovered by Lieutenant Taylor. After that, Thomas must return to Earth. He won't be welcome on the frontier. If he's prosecuted, he'll likely get hard labor at mineral processing for a good four to five years. If he survives, Dr. Safford had a look of horror on her face. That's an extensive laundry list, young lady. Are you quite through? Tasha smiled. Not quite. It is incumbent upon Munis to acknowledge Dr. Suzuki's involvement in shifting the glacier. It was his negligence which caused possible damage to a vast resource. This is the very charge Earthers pile onto us year after year without cause. For decades, Earth has claimed there isn't room for the both of us i.e. government enclaves and free men. We want people to know exactly what government brings to them. In a last-ditch effort, Dr. Safford said, I don't get you, Lieutenant Taylor. Just whose side are you on these days? You could have pulled Thomas out of here rather than colluding with these, these colonists. Taylor sat perfectly still. The easy-going cop's gaze became menacing as he addressed the director. Excuse me, ma'am, but first and foremost, I am a peace officer. As such, I'm on the lookout to squelch problems before they occur. As I see it, events on Mars were beginning to spiral out of control. The Star Olympus bombing went against everything I believe in and still turns my stomach. Weeks later, Thomas Safford and Dr. Suzuki were on a Star Olympus transport, headed to orbit. Lieutenant Taylor and two of his men were escorting them, where Taylor would also testify against Suzuki. The craft silently docked with the Virgin Interplanetary Liner, Alfred Nobel, taking them back to Earth. Tasha, Brandon, and Gina were there to see them off. Brandon asked, So Gina, are you going to miss Thomas? Gina was stoic, not teary-eyed. She said, despite all the havoc he caused, I never saw that side of him. That shows you how well we could fool ourselves. I'm tougher now and a little bit smarter. Besides, maybe now you can set me up with your friend Ole. Anyway, 
he isn't being charged. So what will happen to him? Brandon said he'll disappear inside the cavernous UN building with a meaningless death job. It will take a few years before he has any kind of power base. Hopefully we won't have to worry about him. Tasha added. Suzuki is the price Dr. Safford is paying to give Thomas a way out. She has her eye on the Nobel, so she'll take up his research. She could drill core samples out there until doomsday, but I don't think she'll make it. The researchers on Olympus Mons find something new every week. Brandon could see his friend Lawson's thought as she took in the fruits of their labor. Vehicles shot over the lip of the caldera every five to ten minutes, sometimes several in succession, he asked. So, Tash, you have that thousand-yard stare. What are you thinking about? You're a genuine Martian pioneer and hero. She smiled and flipped her long ponytail back over her shoulder. I was thinking of what Gina said and wondered if our ancestors in Kansas, the outback, or the Sahara felt the same way. When they woke up each day, Brandon asked, I must have missed the point again. What was that? Tasha said that they were still alive, glad to be a little bit tougher and a little bit smarter.